Hey, well, uh, feel free uh, in the future uh, with any questions you have, you can email me or text me. Um, I have a few guys that do that regularly from the field and ask me questions about masonry. Uh, this is my masonry related background. Pretty much it goes from 1972 to 1986. Um, worked on just about every kind of construction you can. Schools, prisons, residences. Um, and then my career path itself, uh, I started out as a structural detailer working for a steel company here in Washington, D.C. as a draftsman for one year, and then I got into masonry and then design build construction. Uh, as I was a conceptual designer during that time, um, so I was still on the drawing board. Uh, then disaster restoration work, and finally this. And uh, believe it or not, to date, I'm at about 19,294 home inspections since in 30 wow. years. Wow. Yep. So I actually number my inspections. And so since I started my company, I was at 23 is year 23, and then 13,694. Then before that, I worked for a smaller firm as a subcontractor, did 2,800 inspections, and I've done about 2,800 inspections in Relo. So that's about where I am. I, I look younger than I am. I'm 72. Um, so the purpose of this is to, tr to help you guys properly write your reports, use right terminology um, based on things that you've observed and fully understand what's going on, hopefully based on some of what I'm going to share with you today. And we're going to start with a little bit of history. Um, the bottom line is masonry has been around for about 6,700 years. Um, of course, most of it was tombs. Uh, some of it is residences up in Scotland that are very, very old, 5,700 years old. In our own country, uh, out in the West, we have those, uh, the Pueblos and uh, other similar adobe houses that were uh, built. So altogether, masonry has been around for about 6,700 years. Uh, just cut, just for writing purposes, you know, I just wanted to use uh, masonry in a couple sentences just to make sure you understand what it is and how it's used in terms of writing. So, uh, as a noun, you know, mason, the masonry fell on a fireman. Uh, masonry masonry was his trade. Is another way to use masonry as a word, uh, and their masonry was outstanding. So in that case, it's more like uh, their what they produce. Uh, masons are skilled workers, obviously. Uh, Nowadays, so much there's no apprenticeship anymore, which is unfortunate because most of what I'm going to share with you, most Masons don't even know anymore uh, because there's no apprenticeship. But uh, if you go back a few hundred years um, into the medieval time and also in the colonial time, Masons were architects. They knew everything. Uh, they, they were brilliant guys. Uh, and just as a... Um, for instance, you know, if, if you uh, wanted to establish a 90 degree angle and all you had was a point and one line, uh, Pythagoras, he came up with the original theory of how to do this with math, uh, but we would not normally use that out in the field. That's a little too uh, laborious. But his theorem you made it possible to um, come up with your hypotenuse and thereby get a perfect 90. Well, out in the field, um, this is that um, formula, by the way, but out in the field, uh, we're more likely gonna use a square or we're gonna do, how many people have heard of the three, four, five formula? Okay, well, actually, if you can imagine taking the square or a three, four, five, and then pulling a line off of that, when you get 25 feet away, you could be six inches off, eight inches off, Nowhere near perfect, but uh, through engineering science and the use of compasses, you can get it exact, and I mean perfect, which is pretty exciting. So this is the type of stuff these guys would have known and I used. I used to joke with my bricklayer buddies. I'd say, look, you, you use your three, four, five or your square, and I'm going to use these two different size sticks, and mine will be more perfect than yours. Um, and here's how you do it. So you would take your shorter stick, or in this case, a cord or whatever, and swing your arc and establish the two points out on either side of the point that you're trying to go 90 degrees off of. 
And then you swing two more arcs with your larger stick and where they intersect, that's perfect 90. And it's, you won't fail, it's perfect. Um, so that, that's really the kind of stuff that Masons knew and used every day in their lives. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that's been forgotten, unfortunately, with your Masons today when all they're working on is brick veneer and they're not really doing anything structural. Uh, similarly, with a square, if, if you want to make sure that it's perfectly um, square, the best way to do it is to ch tech, check with diagonals. Uh, if they're not square, you're going to end up with a parallelogram. But if they are square, both of the diagonals should be equal. You don't even have to do the math on this or know uh, numbers, but as long as it's a chord and, and both ways you stretch it diagonally, it's the same, then you're square. So there's a lot of tricks to doing this out in the field. Um, but now I'm going to get into some of the things that you'll need or that I recommend that you get familiar with if you're not familiar with in terms of um, different things that Masons do and some home inspectors know to do, but I'm hope, hoping that this will be uh, helpful in terms of how to inspect masonry. And really, uh, you can apply it to other types of uh, inspecting too. So first, I'm going to talk about site perspective. So this is one point perspective where everything that you see is going to a vanishing point uh, way off in the distance. That's called one point perspective. This is another picture of one point's perspective. Your lower right floor uh, edges are going to, to a vanishing point, so are your uppers. That's a va uh, vanishing point and that's one point perspective. This is two point perspective where you have, you look down either of those streets and the same thing's going on, the, the vanishing points Everything, all the lines of the buildings, everything is all going to converge in two different vanishing points, right and left. So that's the idea behind a vanishing point, and that's how you start to get some dimension to, uh, in this case, a building or anything like that. Now, this is three-point perspective. We'll, we'll never really use that, but that's where you start to get a sense of height, where you're seeing your Big Ben get smaller as it goes up, or... Uh, Empire State Building gets smaller as it goes down because you're up. But uh, so that we won't use much of that. But uh, one and two point perspective is very useful in home inspecting. And so this is one of the ways you, that you do it. If you were to walk up to a large brick surface, um, as you walk closer and closer to it, you want to watch and watch and see that all of that plane of the masonry disappears at the same instant. If it doesn't, you've got a problem there's a belly in the wall or something's going on. Same thing across a flat surface. You know, it, when you look, you walk and you start duck down and when you finally, you want to see it all disappear at the same time. If it doesn't, uh, there's an irregularity there. Now, how do Masons use that in everyday life? We lay brick to a line and uh, we would have the each brick, the top of the brick, even with the top of the line and about one sixteenth of an inch off. No one's supposed to be touching the line. If you touch the line, everyone else is going to be following you out and you'll start to put a belly in the wall. So everybody's got to not touch the line. So imagine if you had a line pulled very tight, the length of a gymnasium, because we're working on stuff that big sometimes. Well, and believe me, we're, we're pulling these lines so tight that if you've ever seen Nylon Mason's line, two guys will pull it. We will walk 10, 15 feet and pull it so tight that if it breaks loose, anything that's on that line like a line twig is coming at you like a bullet. It's going to be, it's very taut. So, but in spite of that, when you have that much length of the building, the very weight of the line itself causes sag, and so can any minor uh, breeze. You can have line sag, and then you have line deflection from the breeze. So we have what's called line twigs. And what you'll do is you'll have masons set brick at maybe uh, one third intervals down the line. And then a bricklayer will sit sight or crouch down and look across the surface of those bricks. And same thing, just like in your top picture, you want to see them all disappear at the same time. That's how you know that things are perfect. 
and then you use those twigs to hold the line up. You pick the line up, and that way the wind can't blow it out, and it's, there's no more sag anymore, and then everybody lays to that. So that, that's one point perspective again, and that's how they would uh, temporarily secure the, the twig to the top of the uh, brick. But now how do we use it? Uh, for instance, in a, in a crawl space or out uh, where there's a pier that's going to be supporting a porch, you would look at your top corners of all your piers, and again, you want the front face and the top face to disappear all at the same time. Um, so you just slowly start moving until they all vanish, and, and you're watching to make sure all of them vanish at the same point. If they don't, then you have settlement. And so one of the uh, piers might be settled downward, or it might be rotating out. But as you do this exercise, it becomes quite obvious what's going on. Uh, same thing with one point perspective. Again, looking down the uh, joints of the brickwork here, right about middle screen, you'll see that the that joint for the first two piers looks okay, and then all of a sudden that last one, the far one, drops down about a joint. And so you know something's going on, and you go around the corner, and sure enough, well, the whole corner's dropping. So, so that's one way of, uh, one of your tools or one of your skills that you'd like to learn or keep in mind when you're looking at masonry. Uh, levels is another tool, of course. They come in handy. I don't normally break my level out. Uh, uh, most of the time, I don't need to. You, you, when you've laid brick for 15 years, you know, I can probably look at most anything and tell you it's out a quarter of an inch. You just, it just becomes ingrained in you. Uh, out of level or, or out of plumb, to me, just jumps out at me. But um, something to have that's really handy is a plumb bob. I don't know how many guys have one or are, are really... Uh, versed in how to use it, but they're incredibly uh, helpful. And in fact, that's how these were built. Uh, nowadays, they do chimneys. My, my brother worked on an industrial chimney up in uh, Baltimore that was about 250 feet tall. Uh, they use lasers now, but back then, right down the center of it would be a plumb bob, and you just keep measuring off that plumb bob, and that's how you would uh, keep things straight. But, uh, for instance, on this picture on the left, that plumb bob string is actually touching the masonry on the foundation up at the uh, top, and that's how far it's out of, out of plumb. The plumb bob isn't even touching the wall. But, and it also, the, the middle picture is looking at a chimney that's a little bit out of uh, plumb. If you hold the line out full, uh, the full length of your arm, and then sight uh, the chimney and compare it to the line, you can see that the uh, chimney is leaning a little bit to the right. And a little more obvious, the, uh, the pier, the porch pier on the right. But when you have something like this, you know, you have to start thinking, well, if the foundation has moved as much as this uh, one on the left, what's happening structurally inside? And uh, when in this particular one, when I went inside, uh, that's a girder that has pulled completely out of the pocket. In fact, I don't even know what's holding it there because that's just a piece of hardwood flooring that it's sitting on that's actually can't leave it out over the block work, so I'm surprised it hasn't flipped upward. Another tool that's handy uh, is a line and line blocks. Yes, these are really masonry tools, but they are really handy if you're trying to figure out what's going on um, with a building. Once you uh, go ahead and tie them to the line blocks, you would put it through a you, you'll see there's a little groove in it. You tie, you tie it tightly around it and then pull the line tight, and then you're able to see how far off uh, the masonry is. And in this case, it's a whole brick of brick course. There's a big hump in this wall uh, that, yeah, you would have known it was there anyway. This, is, this one's so obvious. But, uh, but the line really helps you in terms of uh, seeing bellies and walls and such. And in this case, the, uh, this is a tree root that has pushed the foundation wall in an inch and a quarter. So let's talk about stone for just a minute. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on stone. We don't see that much of it. But the one thing to understand about stone, unlike uh, brick masonry or block masonry, is the, the mortar is completely different. Um, of course, your, your mortar for brick and block is very pliable and wet, but you, you can't use mortar like that in stone. It has to be very dry, so dry that if you picked up a bunch of it and squeezed it hard, 
it would clump, but that's about how dry it's got to be because stone is not very absorbent and it's, it's really heavy. So if you use wet mortar, you go a couple courses of stone up and it's going to start squishing all the mortar out from under the stones below. So it's got to be very dry. And with that in mind, you can't have a cavity behind a, a solid stone uh, veneer. Uh, it needs the, the uh, framing to support it until it sets. So really, unlike brick veneer, there is no cavity. Uh, I guess if you used a, a, a weep screed, you could have a cavity now in modern times. But back then, you would just felt paper, paper over top of your, uh, your framing, and then you just go ahead and start building your stone uh, up against that. You, had, you, you, you do have wall ties in it, so that'll hold it in place while it's kind of loose and uh, unstable. But it is relying very heavily on the wall framing to stay in place until it sets. Uh, flagstone and slate, that's a really unusual uh, veneer. Uh, it actually, I guess, is to some degree hanging on the, the wall, it, but, but I never really liked this installation. But this is how it's done. I just wanted to show this in case you ever looked at flagstone and wondered how is that actually done. Uh, usually the way it's done is wire is nailed to the wall, the wall framing, and then you have your uh, mortar up against the wall, the stone is pressed against the wall, and then they, they use uh, one by fours or one by twos that uh, are wired to hold the face of the brick consistent against the building until it sets. So uh, that's the only thing holding it in place uh, up until you strip it later is, is one by fours. It's, it's a really different type of uh, installation, never cared for it. But, you know, I've never seen one fall apart. I don't, I don't know what holds it in place. It is metal lath there, but uh, I always expected, having watched it installed, that it would fail, but I've never seen one that has. Okay, on to brickwork. You have several different types of brick. The one we're most familiar with is standard brick, which is the three courses in every eight inches. Uh, modular brick is five courses in every uh, 16 inches. The larger sizes, obviously, they're just trying to get more brick in the wall per motion. And so it, it, uh, it's, it's money saving is all it is. Um, brickwork, I think I lost a slide there. Well, at any rate, so maybe I'll find that slide later. But the uh, you'll see spalling in brickwork uh, between the 60s and 70s, uh, where the, the face is popping off. There was a time period where uh, brick was too absorptive, and there wasn't any kind of regulations on uh, how absorbed it could be. And so uh, there was a lot of spalling. Uh, and that's where the ASTM standards came from, uh, that and also rating uh, brick in terms of their ability to carry weight. This is, of course, a fire brick. Fire bricks actually were uh, developed for boilers. They ended up in fireplaces, but uh, that was a relatively new uh, development. They were, in boilers, they're laid on their, on, they're laid flat like a stretcher with a very thin uh, coat of, uh, of a mortar. This is, uh, Basically, I guess a lot of people will ask you that question, but that's the reason. It, it just promotes drying, and it doesn't really reduce the, uh, the uh, weight-bearing ability of the brick very much. And in fact, in most cases nowadays, it's just brick veneer anyway, so it doesn't even really matter. This was the slide I thought I had lost. Um, so this is a 60s to 70s brick. Um, Sanford was one of the companies that made them. Uh, and when the ASTM standard came out, they either had to change the composition of the brick or just close down. Uh, so a lot of them had to bring materials off-site to uh, meet the uh, standard. Anybody recognize this? Yeah, it, it's uh, what's called reclaimed brick. Um, so the uh, left picture, that's painted brick. The right one, that's uh, a brick that was the inside of a flue of an old building. These come off of row houses in, in uh, big cities. Uh, that's why you have the mortar on the faces, because some of those brick actually were, were inner withes of brickwork, and uh, the mortar didn't come off altogether. But uh, 
it really was a bad idea. Originally, brick, um, those brick were called by a mason who knew what he was doing and realized that your softer oranger bricks, they're not really weather worthy. And so they didn't lay them outside, they were all inside. Um, so when you lay them outside, this is what happens, you do get spalling. See, they, they were bricks that came from the interior of the building originally. Of course, these are just normal uh, cracks, just to make sure you understand the difference. You know, they're not running up through the wall. They, the brick came out of the kiln like that. Concrete masonry units, CMUs, uh, they came out, well, they were developed in 1890 and are being sold around 1900. And that's what they look like. A concrete block, uh, they, they, they can bear a lot of weight. Most of these masonry materials can bear an unbelievable amount of weight. Um, and that's one of the things I want to impress upon you in this section about materials is that uh, there's no such thing as a fragile masonry foundation, that their ability to carry weight is probably exceeds, you know, a residential application by 40 times. Easily. Oh, I thought were you going to ask a question. No, a little local history. When I was a, we moved here in the late fifties okay. into Alexandria, Fairfax County, and I remember the uh, brickyards down on Route One, and they were all used brick, and the winos would clean the uh, mortar off. Yeah. Yeah. And lots and lots and lots of houses in this area. Have the used brick with the orange brick. Yeah, it's a flash in the pan. They, they really showed up in the late 40s, uh, but they really became very popular in the 60s. I laid a lot of them, and it was fun laying them, but at the time we weren't really thinking about you know, the, the uh, consequence of using those soft salmon colored brick. Yeah, well, and you might notice that no one cleans brick anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that drives me nuts as a mason. We we never delivered a job without cleaning the masonry. Now, no build, builders don't clean masonry anymore. It's <laughs> kind of hard to believe. So these are a concrete block, really cinder block. Um, your earlier block or, or blocking again in the 50s or more really 60s, they really started going down on the cement content and they they were using a lot of cinder and they were very absorptive and uh, you know, substandard. And so when you were around flat grades or no gutters, they would hold so much water that they'd just start um, uh, spalling just like a brick. You won't see that today again because the ASTM standards, the concrete block have to meet a certain cementitious uh, content. So that's kind of uh, another flash in the pan. You'll see that in, in houses in the 50s or 60s and 70s mostly. Concrete block are not supposed to be laid like this. They're not rated to carry weight on their side and especially not on their end. Uh, they're only rated to carry it on their top and it's important to not use them in other ways. In this one in particular, that little girder right there is, uh, or, or beam, whatever they're using, is on actually the web of the end of the block, which it's kind of a mind blowing. Um, so this is interesting, but uh, I don't really see it as a problem. I don't write this up. But these are concrete masonry lintels. You probably see them all the time supporting uh, fireplace uh, hearths. Um, it's actually wrong. It's not the way you're supposed to use these lintels. Um, but it works. And so I haven't written it up because in my whole career, I've only seen one time where one actually cracked and uh, made the uh, hearth start to drop down a little bit. But they're really supposed to be used with, with see how they have a top, the, the marking at the top? And that's because they have a, a, a tension and compression rod that goes through them. And the reason there is actually a top, you know, you could ask yourself, well, why aren't, why isn't either of the two edges a top? Well, it's because they actually are crowned, just like a joist, so that as they take on more weight, they'll start to straighten out. Um, so again, in, in this particular application, I've not seen a big problem with it, but it's wrong. Um, I, don't, I don't even put it in the report. I, I just look at it as long as it's not cracked, I just keep moving. Um, just for your own use, 
you know, masonry, you can actually eyeball uh, distances or with using uh, the fact that th three concrete blocks for feet, a, a brick and a half is roughly 12 inches. Uh, three bricks is roughly 24 inches. And I say roughly because brick tend to be a little more than eight inches. Um, so you have to watch that. But nine courses of brick is two feet. So you can actually, without having to pull out a ruler, kind of estimate where on a wall something is happening. If you need to know how many feet down the wall it is, you can just count, count your block or brick and figure that out. Okay, now this is in regard to brick and block in general. Brick, uh, how many times have you guys gone into a foundation or a crawl space and noticed that there's no cracks in the brickwork, but there are cracks in the blockwork behind? All the time. Yep. So there's two types of cracks that'll happen in that blockwork behind the brickwork. Um, this one here, I'm showing you that it's more flex, where if you see that the uh, crack is larger at the bottom or at the top than the bottom, something's going on where it's actually curving the footing a little bit. Um, or it could be stair-stepped, it doesn't matter. The reason is that uh, brickwork has a higher percentage of mortar, and mortar offers the system flexibility, so the concrete block, no crack, and the brickwork with all that much you know, smaller units and much more mortar, it'll actually give a little bit of flex to it. So mortar offers uh, masonry flexibility. In fact, it really is the only flexible material in there. Uh, hello, hello. How, how do you repair that uh, step crack between the uh, block? Well, if you're going to repair it, you would chisel it out and repoint it. Um, honestly, in most cases, I tell people, if, if that's all it is, it's hairline, just leave it alone. The more you mess with it, the worse it gets, and the more you know, um, conspicuous it becomes. Depends on the crack. A lot of times, especially when it's a, a crack outside, you know, people want to always fix things, but you know, the chances of actually matching that mortar are pretty slim. Um, so if you think it's conspicuous now, wait till you're done fixing it. <laughs> and then it'll really be conspicuous. Uh, mortar also is the only thing that really helps dry the system. It's, it's more porous than any other material. And so the moisture is actually evaporating out uh, through a, like a wicking process through the, the mortar itself. So mortar, there are a lot of types of mortar. Um, clay and mud, believe it or not, you've seen it, and I'll tell you where, but most people don't see it. Uh, don't realize they're looking at it. Gypsum mortar, we almost never see. I, I think that you'll find that in the uh, houses that you look at in row houses where they're, they're a really uniform brick and the hair of the joint is really super fine. That's a gypsum mortar, more than likely. Lime mortar, uh, we see a lot of that in very old buildings. And then, of course, our, mo our more modern cement mortars. So, obviously, mud and clay is the, the lowest weight bearing capacity. Uh, most of the time you'll see it in interior use, in chimneys and such. Lime mortar and Portland are the ones we're going to see the most of. But again, back to uh, the clay mortar. If you've ever looked at a house that has a stone foundation, inside of that stone foundation usually is clay mortar. Uh, the main reason being that lime mortar was really very labor intensive and expensive to, uh, to make. So usually they use clay which would bear the weight, and then they would just go ahead and seal the outer joints with the lime mortar. Just a little bit of interest. There's no such thing, or there is such thing as tuck pointing, but tuck pointing is actually, uh, it's an art. And it's really trying to take a large joint and make it look smaller by using different colors of mortar. So tuck pointing in most cases in our you know, use of it, it it's, it's a wrong use of the word. Um, repointing also, it, repointing would suggest actually you've pointed it before. Um, repointing is wrong. The, the proper term is pointing. So when masonry needs to be repaired, you, it needs to be pointed up. So how many people have ever gone out to their shed and found a bag of hydrated lime that has turned as hard as a rock? Does anyone know what caused that? 
That's what everybody thinks, and, and that's what I thought too, but that's actually not the case. Um, it's really funny, but uh, this is where we're going to get into some science on lime mortar, which is pretty fascinating. But that bag of lime mortar, lime, uh, hydrated lime has a plastic liner, and it's a very good plastic liner because it's, remember, it's hydrated lime. If it gets any more moisture in it, it's going to turn to like a putty. Um, so it is about as laden with water as it can be, which is why if you touch it, it's real silky. It's actually wet, but it's uh, not quite wet enough to get your hand wet, but it's wet. So that plastic is trying to keep the moisture in the bag. And when that is not allowed to happen, the uh, calcium oxide now joins with calcium or with uh, carbon dioxide and returns to lime mortar, I mean to us limestone. So we're, I'm going to show you how this works. But again, it's, it's calcium um, hydroxide, so it's water and calcium, and it, uh, it's a powder, or it looks like a powder, but it's not. Uh, it's actually very close to wet. So how many people have seen uh, shells in, in their uh, mortar joints and brickwork? I used to think that was aggregate, but it's not. That's where the lime comes from. That's one of your sources of lime. You have limestone, uh, oyster shells, or coil. And what they do is, or coral, I'm sorry, and they'll apply excessive heat to it, real, really heat it up real high, and it becomes, it goes from limestone, which is calcium carbonate, to uh, calcium oxide. All of the carbonation has been removed from the uh, calcium or calcium carbonate, and it's now calcium oxide. Still looks kind of the same. It's all pure white and kind of crunchy, but as soon as you put water to it, it literally deteriorates to mush. And that is where you get your calcium uh, oxide. Once that dries just enough to become powdery, they bag it. But with that being said, the default for calcium oxide is to join with, uh, with uh, carbon dioxide as soon as it can. If it's, if it's exposed to carbon dioxide, it's going to, to become calcium carbonate again, limestone. So that, that stuff in a bag wants to become uh, limestone again. So that's how um, your uh, lime mortar works as far as how it sets. And what you're hoping that it does is when it sets, that it sets within all the nooks and crannies in the brickwork to become limestone. So lime mortar is limestone. And the beauty of lime, lime mortars, uh, one of the really nice things about it is, have you seen brickwork like this where it's really all, well, it's self-healing. Lime mortar, um, not all of the calcium oxide in the mortar is exposed to uh, carbon dioxide. It, it can stay in that calcium uh, hyd hydroxide state for a very long time, but then when cracks form in the brickwork, the uh, calcium oxide moves out and fills those gra gaps, and then it, it uh, joins up with uh, carbon dioxide again to fill the joint. So it's, it's what's called aut autogenous healing, and it's a self-healing process, and it, it can go on for many years. Your modern mortars can do that as well, but not to the same degree. So these are your uh, mortars that are available now. Uh, each one is uh, more, has a much higher PSI rating, so you, your type O is your lowest and type M is your highest. Type N is what you'll see the most of. Um, this is a, your more modern uh, mortars, they actually will set like um, lime mortar, but they also have uh, a feature just like cement where they will also uh, set through hydration. So a percentage of it is, can set underwater. These mortars, along with concrete, uh, to, to really set to their strongest, they have to be cured. No one ever cures them anymore, but uh, uh, they really, for instance, with concrete footings, if you go back uh, to the 40s and 30s, they used to do what's called earth cure or water cure, where they'd actually pour the concrete and fill the ditch with dirt or water and leave it. Because it's that first 30 days uh, that it's going to cure, and you don't want it to dry or set through evaporation. 
the longer it um, sets through hydration, the more silicates that are formed, the denser and harder the concrete gets. So that this, the, the bottom area of this circle here, uh, where you have your uh, calcium silicate hydrates, those are forming over that first month. And if you let the concrete dry out, that doesn't happen to the same degree. So proper curing is important. Um, again, no one does it very much anymore. I always did. I, you know, I'd come back from on my masonry jobs and keep wetting the wall for quite some time. So you have all these uh, regulations that regulate the, the masonry or the mortar in the bag, the brick, as far as PSI ratings and absorption rating. Same with concrete block. There's really only one Achilles heel in the whole system, and that is the mortar, the actual mixing of the mortar, because you don't know who's on the uh, mortar machine. Is he using a square shovel, round shovel? Is he using 17 shovels or you know 13 shovels? So you can end up with uh, mortar that doesn't match. And that, that's usually what's happening when you see mortars that don't match. Probably the guy that was normally the mortar guy, he, he was sick and didn't come in, and someone else was mixing the mortar. I always had my guys use a bucket, buckets for that reason, so there'd be no mistakes. There's your PSI rangings for mortar. All of your PSIs are they're hypothetical. It's assuming that you could evenly spread that weight across the entire surface of the brick block or the mortar bed, which of course you can't do. So in, while it works in theory, you couldn't really apply 24,000 pounds to a, a bed of mortar. It would never happen. Uh, it would it would not survive. So this is talking about different materials and how they're how compatible they are together. So back to the the uh, brickwork on the foundation where it's cracked, uh, the blockwork's cracked inside, and uh, the brickwork is not. In this case, you'll see that that joint or that crack in the blockwork is actually equidistant. There's no change in it. There's not bigger at the top or at the bottom. And that is because, and I, I just learned this probably within the last five or six years myself, but um, you know, block work and all concrete products shrink. Um, like the previous speaker was talking about, uh, most of the reason we have control joints in concrete is because of shrinkage. There is some uh, because of flex too. And, and of course a control joint, you know, where they just score the concrete is saying crack here, it's gonna crack. But block work, uh, being a concrete product, it shrinks. Well, surprisingly, brickwork actually grows. When it comes out of the kiln, it's as small as it's ever gonna be. And once it takes on moisture, it actually grows a little bit. Um, and in residential construction, that's not that big a deal, but I think that's probably what's going on here. We, or stair step again, stair step, as long as they're equidistant. But when you get into high rise construction, that can be a pretty big deal. Um, you know, because you have a, a concrete building 10 stories tall and all the concrete structure over the next, you know, 15, 20 years shrinks a little bit. It's called creep. That's, that's actually a term for that in engineering. It's called creep. And then you have a brick veneer that's actually growing. 10 stories of brick that's going up, 10 stories of concrete that's going down. Uh, and that can become a big problem. You know, sometimes you've seen buildings where there's all, all these repairs and they're usually in that little time period where they had not quite realized this is not a good idea to marry up, you know, brickwork and, and uh, concrete products. They just uh, go in different directions. The solution for this, um, which I think they really don't even bother with this type of construction anymore, but the, the first solution was to just start putting on steel shelf angles onto concrete flooring and support each uh, floor of brickwork on its own shelf angle and then put uh, a sealant uh, between the two floors so that as the two move differently, you know, there was something that would allow that uh, movement. And that's where we ha have control joints. One of the reasons we have control joints, it's not only just uh, movement in terms of settlement, but it's also because of uh, unlike materials uh, and their, their differing characteristics. And that kind of helps prevent stuff like this. You know, this is a very large commercial building. Um, and as you can see, the I think what was going on here, this was probably a very absorptive brick again. And it's the it's same above and below, but the parapet probably stayed a lot wetter and froze a lot 
and uh, it really created a lot of expansion. And so the brickwork just couldn't take that. Uh, kind of looking at this, it's kind of hard to believe that even uh, control joints could have prevented this from happening. But so, Mike, we got a question from the remote audience. Um, how many courses of brick and block should be laid in one day? Oh, you can go up eight feet. Eight feet a day? Yep. Unlike stone. Other, otherwise, otherwise, all that weight starts compressing the mortar. No, below. it really, it really doesn't. Uh, in, in we've we've really gone more than that. Uh, but they say don't go more than eight feet. Uh, but you know, regular masonry mortar, it starts to set to a degree where it can handle some weight pretty fast. So uh, yeah, there were, you didn't have the restrictions restrictions like you do in uh, uh, stone construction. So. In this particular case, you might notice uh, there's a little bit of a gap between the brickwork and the um, steel angle iron. It's, see how it's tight at the right edge, and then it starts to open up as you move towards the center. And then you can look at this garage door opening, and it's actually, yeah, sagged. Uh, and actually, where I'm going with this one is, uh, you'll probably find this interesting that you probably had never really realized exactly what's going on here, but I'll bet you, if you've been doing this for any period of time, you've seen this hundreds of times and just didn't put two and two together. Another sagged angle iron. I don't know if you can tell this, but the top of that overhead door is sagged as well. So what's going on? And this is where we're going to put that sighting across a plane together. So when you walk into the open garage door and start looking up, you're what, what, you want to watch all of the masonry up above the garage door, and you want it to all disappear at the same time. And in this case, it doesn't. So the picture on your left is looking at all of it, but you can already tell, already tell that the upper brickwork is going to disappear first because of the, way, the difference in the joints and their appearance. And then when you move a little more underneath the door, the upper part of the brickwork disappears, lower part you're still looking at. So what does that mean? It means there's a belly in that wall. So Mike, you still have an hour to go, but um, uh, somebody in the remote audience is wanting to know if you're going to talk about problems with mixed matching mortars um, on repairs and pointing, uh, specifically repairs to lime mortar joints with Portland cement mortar. Yeah. And do you see that as a problem? You're going to talk about that? No, actually, I'm not, but I'm happy to bring that in now. Okay. That was more of a historical restoration question. But yeah, I, actually, I did historical restorations the, towards the very end of my career. The bottom line with the re, with the pointing up or restoring historical or any old masonry is this. You've got to use the same uh, mortar that they have. I used to actually send it off to a lab, and then I'd send them also the sand I'm going to use, because obviously I can't find the sand that they used a hundred years ago, but say so you'd send the sand to them, you'd send some of the mortar, and they would send you back a mix that was uh, pretty much uh, as close to a match as you can get. You, you have to use as soft a mortar as before. More importantly, in terms of just for the look, you know, your, your brick are going to be weathered at their top and bottom edges. You don't want to point all the way out to the surface of the brick because of the fact that those weathered edges are going to make the joint appear probably twice the width that it was originally. So once it starts to curve outward, that's where you stop. It's going to be a slightly recessed joint compared to uh, what you originally had, but the look is going to be a whole lot better. Um, the, the, bat, the downside to using a higher cementitious mortar in pointing up, especially if you're bringing it out to the surface as well, is that remember, the um, mortar was what was wicking moisture out of the system. Well, you're using a higher cement, cementitious mortar now, and you're also curling it up the front of the face of the brickwork, which is going to act like a dam. And those two um, problems or those two things will actually accelerate the t deterioration of the brick. It will, it will get worse faster than before. You've actually damaged it uh, and, and really uh, accelerated the damage that's going to happen to that masonry. So it's extremely important to... Uh, to be scientific about restorations. And, you know, I wish every time I saw someone pointing up masonry, I could tell them to stop. But, you know, of course you can't. But 
uh, it's a science restoring uh, historical or any old masonry. And if you don't know the science, don't do it <laughs> because you're just going to mess it up. So back back to this. Um, so obviously with a straight edge, you can see that the brickwork above is straight and then all of a sudden it starts to belly down to that angle iron. So what's really going on? In all these cases, none of the brickwork was cracked. Anybody have a guess why that is? Uh, actually, in this case, no, it's not. So they use microphones. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll just tell you. In every one of these cases, and, and every case you see like this, it's been like this since the day it was installed. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. And so the next question is, can a steel angle iron, especially with a taller back leg, really sag? And the answer is no. But what it can do is twist, and that's what happens. I've had it happen to me when we were actually laying brick on an angle iron that was too small. The architect called it out. We get, you know, six or eight, ten courses, and it starts bellying out. And if you keep going, the angle will twist enough to actually dump the brickwork right onto the scaffold. So the answer is that that's what happens. It can't, you know, because of that tall leg, it can't sag as it is, but it can twist under enough tension, and that's what happens. So as you were laying it up, it's set up, bellied out like that. Hey, Mike. Yes, sir. Um, in DC and and Old Town, where we have two hundred year homes, and uh, especially with chimneys that really rise above the property, um, it's not unusual to see some of these chimneys that haven't been, you know, repaired over time have significant. Uh, arcs or well bends in them uh is that is that weather related you know that's one of those things that uh specialists including myself have kind of argued over what really is going on and honestly we don't know for sure there are a lot of theories um i've seen that where they seen on a house where they actually curled in different directions which is really makes it kind of tough to decide what's going on but it, remember, it's a soft mortar, so it's either mortar washing out on one side or actually freezing, expanding on the other side over and over again, and you kind of get an unlike action where they just curl. Uh, a lot of times you see it on, in uh, chimneys that really don't need pointing. They just over the years have done that. There's some in Fredericksburg that are they're pretty curled. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've talked to um, Bill Kibble. Anybody know Bill Kibble? Yeah, he's a, he's does all all his houses are extremely old. He's a specialist, but he basically says I don't really know either. There's there's a lot of arguments or a lot of theories, but no one's come up with one that that is ironclad as far as why it happens. Okay, so look at this window, and you might I don't know if you'll pick up on it immediately, but uh, well, first of all, that's not a true arch. You'll understand that that. There's nothing uh, self-supporting about that uh, brickwork over that window. That arch is on two pieces of angle, angle iron that are cantilevered over the window. And if you look at it, you can see that on the left-hand side, this angle iron has started to twist as well. It, it's gone down quite a bit. And above that, all the brickwork went down with it. So again, we're getting back to the fact that masonry is marginally flexible. Steel is very flexible. So steel has to be designed or, or it has to be oversized when you're uh, putting masonry on it. And that this is why there's a larger basic truth to this, and that is the fact that the hardest that any arch, lintel, beam, anything will ever work is the day the masonry is laid on it, because at that point, you don't have that interlocking of the brickwork 
to carry weight or to keep weight from going on the beam. Everything is dead weight on that uh, angle iron or uh, beam or whatever it is. And once it sets up, you could take the, the angle iron or beam out, no problem. But it has to, you have to have steel that's either oversized or you have to temporarily <clears throat> support the steel so it doesn't twist when you're laying the masonry on it. So again, jack arch here. Once it's all set up, the only brickwork that's in jeopardy of falling out from that arch is in that little triangle there. So that's... again, once it's set up, uh, most arches, they have a pretty easy life. Uh -huh. In that situation you showed before where the, the where, where we had that belly, but you had the, the lower courses of brick departing, uh, opening up that crack. What, what's the appropriate treatment for that? About the only thing you can do there is chisel it all out and point it in. Just point it in. Point it up. Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, again, this is steel and brickwork, as you can see. Uh, and we've heard steel angle irons that rust. Uh, rust is a, uh, it's unbelievably, uh, yeah, it can expand to six times its uh, original size. And it, it, it's picking up, in this case, two angle irons are picking up two tons of masonry. It's, it's amazing that it can do that, but it does. It, uh, it, it gets a lot of help now with replacement windows uh -huh. where the contractors want everything to look pretty and perfect. And then they not only wrap the, the wood components, they wrap and caulk the lentils, which exacerbates the moisture, yeah. rusting and expansion you, you condition. Stole my thunder. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, yeah. This is a bad idea. If you've got that going on, what you don't want to do is wrap it up. You know, it's just like putting it all in the oven. It's just going to be worse. So that was uh, brickwork or masonry and steel. This is going to be brickwork and framing and uh, how differently they can act. And some of these are pretty extreme and you, you have to scratch your head on exactly what's going on. But I believe in this case, uh, probably the framing was shrinking over time and settling. And uh, the brickwork, of course, is growing a tiny bit, but you can see the pressure on the windowsill is so great that it broke that, that little bottom edge of that uh, brick off where it tucks up under the windowsill. Obviously, the brickwork is actually moving away from the house as well as going down. You can, uh, looking at the uh, sealant, you can tell both, the, both those situations that it's, number one, the brickwork is um, moving away and the framework is, is settling down. Same here, this is all the same house. Now, I'm not really sure what's going on, but as you can see, it actually rotated that windowsill all the way up off its flashing. Uh, one of these two houses, this is a different house, but it's the same condition going on. The brickwork actually was freestanding all the way down to the footing itself. The house actually sat on piers. So I don't know if uh, the piers were on their own footings or if they were all on one monolithic pour that went around the house. Uh, but the only thing I can figure is if it wasn't the framing that actually had shrunk like you have a big girder there wood girder bit there that maybe gave up some of its height as it dried out uh, possibly the, the footing rotated you know but that's the only thing i can think of but uh, there's another dynamic going on there the the fact that the brickwork's actually moving out could be the fact that uh, some of your wall ties that are used to hold brickwork to the house they can be very heavy gauged and if they're pulled down on um, or actually, in this case, they'd be pulled up. Yeah, they'd, they'd be pushed upward a little bit. They don't have any place to go. They can't go against the wall, and so they actually start pushing the brickwork away from the house. That's the only theory, theory I can come up with. This is something that you, you usually only see it in one application. I don't know if anybody can kind of guess what this is, where the, the uh, drywall is pulling apart and the tape is actually popping off the wall. Can anyone connect this with a certain type of construction or house? Townhouse. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason being that um, the wall to the left is on furring strips on the masonry party wall. 
everything else is on wood frame, so they settle differently. In fact, of course, the uh, the, the firewall is not going to settle at all, and so you end up with uh, unlike moving. And so in townhouses, you see these cracks all the time, and sometimes they can be pretty wicked. All right, we're going to get into masonry terminology for a minute, real quick. Like we'll move through this. So, of course, a row of brick is called a course. The uh, the, the brick that we're used to looking at is called a stretcher in most cases. Uh, in solid masonry, the header is the one that ties the two pieces together. The only uh, brick in here that we might not be familiar with it would be your your uh, sailor and your shiner. Soldiers we see now and then; those are on up on their edge. The sailor. You almost never see those. Shiner, it's very rare that you would see those. Uh, each row of brick in terms of uh, height is called a wythe. So a 12 inch solid masonry wall would be three wythes thick. Eight inch solid masonry wall like this is two wythes thick. Bond, uh, there's two ways that a bond is used for masonry in terms of the term. Uh, and, and the most automatic one is for, for someone to say, Mike, let, lay this in a half bond, which is the top picture there. That, that's a half bond brickwork. Below it is three quarter brickwork, three quarter bond. And this is below that is stacked bond brickwork, which I call no bond. You know, basically it's worthless. It, it, the, the, without metal reinforcement, stack bond will not work. So in, when you see stack bond like this, you know, this is a fire department. It, it, this is another one of those uh, masonry patterns that just was a flash in the pan. You don't see it much anymore. Uh, again, 70s maybe. But the only way you can lay that up to where it'll stay is to use what's called bond beams. These are bond beam block where you're reinforcing the wall and it's concrete and reinforcement inside that makes it work because there is no bond outside of the concrete and the reinforcement. Uh, it was just a look. So this is common bond. This is what we're most familiar with here in America in terms of looking at an eight inch solid masonry wall. This is Flemish bond, which uh, is much more uh, prevalent in Europe. But this is, as you can see, that is the most bonded brickwork you'll ever see in your life. And those are the strongest walls. I put them up against concrete any day. The Flemish bond brickwork and concrete, they're pretty similar. They're, they're very durable. Now, just to understand bond in general, uh, I walked up on this the other day, and for most Masons back in my day, this would be inappropriate. You usually try to keep your corner bricks uh, no less than four inches, but in this case, we would break tradition and uh, use something less than a four inch brick to have closer to a half bond. You know, we, we just always liked things to be half over half. And, and in case in this case, that a crack could form in that pier pretty easily up the, the center of it with if there was stress applied to it. These are coin corners. And the only reason I put them in here is because they're not bonded. That, that's an improper installation. See how it's, it's a continuous joint all the way up the building, which is any mason should know not to do that. It's really supposed to be like the one on the right, where you can see the between the coins, there's a, a whole brick that goes half over half into the coin, so that every fifth course you do have something tying it together. So that, that's one use of the word bond, is, is uh, different types of bonds of uh, the masonry units. But also uh, the bond of mortar to the brickwork is another uh, way the term is used, and it has to do with adhesion. And again, when we would install brickwork or blockwork, we would get it pretty saturated the night before. Um, you don't want it soaked, but you want it pretty wet, pretty damp, so that when that mortar hits the block or the brick, the dry brick wouldn't just soak all the moisture right out of the mortar before it's uh, properly set. If you don't do that, you either have a very dry, uh, bed of mortar that will not properly adhere to the brickwork or in the case of it being too wet water will pool between the mortar and the brickwork and again you won't get a good bond so it's pretty important to have the mortar uh, the moisture content of the masonry materials just right in order to get a good bond between the two mortar uh, in general 
on a trowel if you, what we would call shake it down, if you'd get a big trowel mortar and then shake it down one time hard, it would cause the mortar to adhere to the, tr uh, to the uh, trowel and you could turn it upside down like he did. I asked him to do this just so he, I could show you that and that's how you point up. You get it stuck to the trowel and it's a little easier to push into your joints. We strike masonry because it caught, brings paste up to the surface and seals the uh, joint a little bit so it's not quite as porous on the outer surface as it is everywhere else. It's the same as finishing off uh, flat work and, con and concrete. You're bringing paste up to make a very dense top surface. Okay, we're going to talk about footings for a minute. Um, I use the snowshoe because that really is what a footing is. The real foundation of any house is the earth. And the, the footing is just acting like a snowshoe. It's trying to spread the weight a little bit to make it a little easier for it to support the weight. If you don't get it right, things can go wrong. Yeah, all three of those houses are leaning a little bit. The one on the left is not leaning as bad, but they all are. So there are foundations that are concrete and then foundation footings that are also brick. This house was built in 1870 and actually it was dug out. Uh, it was probably more of a cellar and they dug it out um, and exposed the footings. Wasn't so worried about the fact the footings were exposed. Um, but they did in one area actually let the soil come out from under the footing. Um, and that, that's usually not a good idea. When you uh, see excavation around a footing, that, that's when you start to need, need to start uh, perking your ears a little bit. There's what's called an angle of repose. Every soil or gravel or sand has what's called an angle of repose. Uh, how much weight it can support without um, pushing outward. And really, as a rule of thumb, they say you shouldn't get any closer to the bottom edge of a footing than 45 degrees. So if you excavate closer than 45 degrees, you've compromised that footing because it's no longer on un undisturbed soil. Uh, so when you see something like that, where the, the footing has been compromised, you, you definitely need to write that up. Make sure that they realize this is a problem. Sometimes you don't have a footing at all. This, this uh, is a very, very old house and it's just stone and then they excavated on top of that. So the, the foundation was literally coming out from under the house. Um, and in fact, it was so extreme that a company came in and kind of tried to underpin the joists so that the house was now cantilevered off of a, a beam out over what was the foundation, but that's really not a good situation. Now, when you walk up on something like this, uh, this to me is pretty mind blowing. And you might think this isn't a big deal, but this is a huge deal. Uh, you have to think about how much more weight a pier is bearing than any single foot of foundation wall on a house. These piers are probably carrying about 16 times the weight that any linear foot of the foundation is carrying. <clears throat> And it's all sitting on dirt, a column of dirt now that is only has a PSI of two to 3,000. So again, that's, that's why you come up with 16. It's half the span between girders and half the span between the front and back floor joists. So it's a lot of weight concentrated on those footings. You know, I don't know what they're going to do. The only thing I could come up with in terms of how to remedy it uh, would be to actually form and pour a girdle around it uh, and with concrete. But even at that, I would want to wrap it in saran wrap or something first because I'm afraid that the wet concrete would change the, uh, the soil just enough that it would fail, you know, because it's bone dry right now. The other thing that an engineer had mentioned would be to just temporarily support the, the girder and just take it all out and put in another one, but that would probably be a whole lot more expensive than forming and pouring a girdle around it. And I think the girdle would probably work. <clears throat> you just have to be careful when you put the wet materials against that dry dirt. So when you walk up to a foundation and you're seeing this, this is just rough masonry. I think a lot of guys might think that the mason was 
uh, just off in terms of where he should transition from between brickwork and block work. But I think that's probably a, an improper assumption. Most of the time we as Masons knew exactly where we were supposed to transition. Um, and this is probably soil that has eroded away and compacted. And in both cases, the problem is your footing might be shallow, especially in the case of a um, crawl space. So in this particular case, I pulled out my, a probe and started probing and sure enough, the footing was uh, really, old. the top of the footing was four inches out of, uh, below grade, which means it was shallow. And in fact, as I walk along, first of all, I, wanted, I do wanna mention this. I don't know about you guys, but over the years, um, anything that can be put in my report in terms of, a, oh, by the way, I put it in there. And for that reason, we never get callbacks. And I mean, I never, never get callbacks. No one calls me and asks me a question about anything. And it's 30 years of every time I got a phone call, I would ask myself, what can I put in a report so I won't get this call again? And a lot of times it's, you're trying to make sure that when uncle, you know, know it all shows up and says, he should have said something about this, that I did say something about it. So a lot of times it's a matter of, it might not be an issue, but you know that they're going to call you back about it, so I put it in. So in this case, you know, I have a, a note that says, you know, basically that if there's an exposed masonry, it could be a problem. As I went further down, it was a problem. The footings were completely out of the ground here. And, and the problem with this house is it was a, on a very steep hill. So it was the back side of the house, and it was a steep hill straight down to the woods with no easy way to get dirt around there. So that it was gonna be an extremely expensive fix. There's more footing. <clears throat> so this is a, uh, a building that I did down in Newport News. And this was probably the worst uh, footing, footing problem I've ever seen in my life. The, the, this building was, all those buildings were a disaster. They had huge humps in them. And, and I put brickwork, I mean, put my line blocks on there and lines. And this is a picture you saw previously where I actually had a hump in it, a full course of brick of a hump. And then as you started walking around, you realized that doors wouldn't open. Um, they'd, they'd hit the floor. That, so you had foundation that was all moving around. Then the, all the concrete floors were um, poured within the, the masonry foundation. So they were, um, free floors and they were all settled. You, you were walking uphill into uh, certain rooms, living rooms and such. Actually, kind of hard to see, but there are two by fours in front of these doors that are acting like dams to keep the water from running into the building because this, it had settled so badly that the building was below grade now and the, wa the w sidewalk there is poured higher to trying to keep the water from getting in as well. You know, there are cracks all over the place. This stairway was really leaning badly. And again, this goes back to that uh, girder that was pulled out of the wall. You know, I, I can't see anything here, but I know that, you know, with this kind of movement, you know, there could be girders that are literally about ready to fall right out of pockets. So um, it was pretty disturbing. And it, it was an apartment complex. They're all, all of them were uh, occupied. This, this is that foundation where the uh, girder had fallen out of the pocket. So we're going to talk about solid masonry. How are we doing on time? It's 10 minutes after 12. We're going until 12.40. Okay, good. Solid masonry construction. Anybody know where the tallest uh, building, solid load-bearing building is in the planet? Yep, and it still holds that title. Took forever to build it. Okay, the beauty of solid masonry is it's durable. Um, it can, you know, this is World War II pictures, obviously. Um, you know, and so much of it was standing because it is solid masonry. That, that's the beauty of interlocking masonry units. You know, weight can be transferred pretty easily. Uh, every course of brick is being transferred half over half over half over half. 
So that's the nice part about solid masonry. And back to Flemish bond. Um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when it comes to brick foundations, solid masonry brick foundations, I have seen, I, I don't know that I've ever seen one that failed. Um, most of the failures are uh, concrete block walls. Uh, most solid masonry brick, uh, brick foundations, they're fine. They're incredibly durable. One other thing about uh, solid masonry is it does have thermal mass. It might not be um, insulated, but it does hold and maintain a temperature for quite a period of time. <clears throat> So once they went to block work, that's where you started seeing foundation failures. Uh, they were deciding that block work with uh, horizontal joint reinforcement was enough, but it really proved not to be enough. Um, horizontal joint, re joint reinforcement on top of that being steel, it rusts. Even if it's galvanized, we've torn walls apart that were like 20 years old and it was still rusting, even though it was galvanized. So the unfortunate thing is uh, with masonry, almost any alleged improvement that's happened in masonry over the years has actually been a compromise. It, the original product was, uh, you know, you, you couldn't improve upon it. Everything they've done to save labor has usually cost you in terms of durability and, and the longevity of the product. As far as why you have those two types of uh, joint reinforcement, truss and ladder, ladder works a little better with um, when you're doing reinforcement and concrete uh, fill. So that's why they'll usually use ladder when they're reinforcing the wall. Again, when you pull up on a solid masonry building, um, or actually it doesn't have to even be solid masonry, but when you see something like this, where you have a solid masonry porch and it's not covered, that should kind of perk your ears a little bit um, when you go inside of this building or in the crawl space, all, all the floor joists behind that porch, they are uh, decayed. Solid masonry holds water for a long period of time. Once it gets saturated, it stays saturated for months. And so you have to look behind solid masonry porches and expect to find joists in the pocket that are decayed. Same thing with uh, row houses that don't see much uh, sunshine. You know, most of the time your row houses, the floor joists go across the width of the building. And so your pockets on the two right and left sides of the house, they'll be rotted. In this case, this building, they were all rotted and rotted so badly someone had already put in a girder and they had it on dry stacked uh, brick in the crawl space. So essentially the masonry was not bearing the weight of the floor joists anymore. These girders were. And this really was temporary support in my mind. <clears throat> so somebody's wanting to know if the uh, if wider footers would help. In which, in which one? Uh, I think the one before, right? I don't think so. I mean, well, yes, they, they might have, and maybe going a lot deeper. And that was just a uh, they. This is prior to the when they were starting to actually uh, do analysis of the soil. You know, now, of course, you've got to analyze the soil and then you design your footings based on what kind of soil it's on and, and its uh, ability to bear weight. I think that was the bigger problem. They, they might have had to actually put it on piers or pilasters, I guess you'd call it. Okay, we're going to talk about spanning openings for a minute. Of course, uh, one of the most original ways to span win window and door openings was stone. Wood actually has been around for a long time, and surprisingly, you would think it would rot, but uh, uh, it's very rare that I ever see wood lentils uh, used in this case that have ro actually rotted. They, they seem to do quite well in masonry. Arches is my favorite, and you know, you'll hear mixed reviews about arches, but honestly, arches, I think, are uh, they're, they're really the best option. Some people will tell you that arches fail, and I totally disagree with that. Uh, but I'll explain why in just a minute. Uh, this is a multi-centered arch. It's got, uh, it's 150 years old or 100 years old, I think it was. This one is 180 years old, all these arches. These, of course, are 2,000 years old. 
the truth is that arches, they don't fail. People fail to maintain them. You know, you have to remember this is old lime mortar. When masons were building the houses with lime mortar, they did expect to be called back from time to time to do some maintenance. You know, the joints wash out. Uh, sometimes things will happen. If you don't keep, re, you know, pointing up the masonry again, then yeah, any arch that's not maintained will fail. But if you keep it uh, properly mortared up, uh, pointed, it, it will never fail. And that's really the problem. Once people started using uh, cement-based mortars, I think they just forgot that lime mortars need maintenance and that the uh, uh, Portland cement mortar probably doesn't. You know, it, it's very durable, but not like a lime, you know, lime mortar needs maintenance. And so it's really a, a more a problem of neglect. But the beauty of an arch is that a properly built arch, the more weight you put on it, the stronger and harder it resists. It just gets stronger and stronger and the tension becomes more and more, but it will not give. It can't give, there's no place for it to go. So arches are, they're just, uh, it's a great invention. So you have gauged arches or what's called jack arches, either one. Segmented arches, maybe these are semicircle arches. Gothic arches, bullseye arches, and these are just stone arches. And this is no arch. <clears throat> this is obviously not a self-supporting arch. It's just the uh, soldier courses that they put a little um, angled piece on the, the right and left to make it look like a jack arch. But if you without steel, this would fail. Same here. Um, you know, you can't have a joint in the middle of a span over top of a window. So. Without steel, that would fail as well. This, I just threw this in because it's interesting. <clears throat> I, I know what's going on here just because I was a mason and laid these things up, but uh, anybody have any guesses on what's going on here? This is a solid masonry wall, and that's not the bottom of an I-beam. You might think that it is, but it's actually the bottom of what's called a hung plate which is hung off the I-beam. The construction is actually like this. So the I-beam is one course of brick above and then the, the hung plate is below that. And so that kind of helps you understand what you're actually looking at is every time that steel comes back up, that's a weld point where it's welded to the little gusset plate that holds it to the bottom of the I-beam. Now, I think what's going on here was that this was not it didn't have proper flashing or um weep holes and so what was happening is mortar would freeze in or water would freeze in there and over and over again it would expand against the steel and it just jacked the steel down i think that's what's going on is it just was too water laden <clears throat> and that water would freeze and it was just really applying pressure to that hung plate So back to home inspections in general, when you first pull up on a house, you know, I'm always, my mind is always going a mile a minute, even before I get out of the car. And there's so many things that you can kind of assess right off the top, you know, that you, you see here, a solid masonry portrait. And again, these are descriptions of, you know, what's going on in terms of the report reporting solid masonry foundation. So it's either brick over concrete or brick over a concrete block, brick veneer, obviously. In this case, a thing that jumps out at me is that you have some chimneys there that aren't going to meet uh, any of today's standards. And in this case, obviously, they put a chimney up and realized later that it wasn't drawing well, and so they extended it upward some. Why isn't it drawing well? Well, chimneys near trees, or in this case, a roof line, a much higher roof line, air, when it blows across that roof, it tends to curl downward. And so what's happening is the prevailing wind must be from the front of the house to the back, and it kind of curls the air down right at that uh, chimney, and it makes it difficult for it to draw properly. So what else can determine whether or not uh, it's brick veneer or solid masonry? Anyone? Weep, weep holes. Yeah. 
Yeah, weep holes are not always to see. They don't always do them like on the left where it's the whole joint out. Sometimes they just would lay a cord into the brickwork and then pull it out while the brickwork was still green. And sometimes mud dauber wasps will fill in that hole. So sometimes you'll stare at the brickwork for quite some time thinking there isn't a weep hole. But finally, you'll realize, yes, there is. So how important are weep holes? How many people think they're extremely important? I don't. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're, they're nice. How often have I ever, well, actually, you know, in the 19,000 home especially, I've done one time, once, I saw where not having weep holes was absolute disaster. All the floor joists were rotted. It didn't have flashing either. Uh, the brickwork had been added in that case later, and it was just everything about that was horrible. But it, it's a good practice. And when, when you look at weep holes, you want to make sure that there is a, uh, actually flashing back in there somewhere. You know, the way it works is the flashing comes out from behind the water resistant barrier, turns into the brickwork, and then you have your weep hole. But the only way the water's gonna get back there is if you have um, bad flashing somewhere else. You know, I have my own opinion about how much brick leaks, and I, I'd say under ideal conditions, zero. But we'll, we'll go there in a few minutes. So I, we'll get into identifying. So obviously this is a solid masonry. That's pretty much a no brainer. You can see header courses. Again, header courses here. How about this house? Is this solid masonry or is this a uh, brick veneer? How many people say uh, brick veneer? Okay, it is solid masonry. Uh, in spite of the fact that it has stretcher courses, that's a regular bond, uh, once you go around a corner, the wall is too thick, and that tells me that it's solid masonry. It's eight inches of masonry with furring strips, and then gypsum board lath and plaster. It's about 10 inches of wall there. So that's one way to tell. Another way, of course, to tell if it's solid masonry or not is to see masonry going up between the floor joists in the crawl space or in basement. You also see the fire cut. Um, joist. Now, fire cut joist, you know, not only is it nice because all your joists will, during a fire, fall out neatly um, without making any real, you know, causing any structural damage. The more important reason that you have fire cut joists is for the sake of firemen. They're trying to fight the fire so a whole parapet doesn't come down and hit them. <clears throat> Another way to tell whether solid masonry, of course, you'll see exposed masonry up in the attic. Parapets is another giveaway and plaster directly on brickwork. All you got to do is walk up to that particular wall and hit it with your knuckles and you'll know it's solid. So with the uh, uh, with the absence of um, headers, how would the solid masonry wall have been um, designed? Would the brick have been interlaced? That's a good question. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm assuming it's got to be um, either horizontal joint reinforcement or um, wall ties. Yeah, but horizontal, horizontal joint reinforcement makes more sense. All right, so we're on to brick veneer. And speaking of which, the transition between uh, solid masonry and brick veneer happened in the 40s, between the 40s and 60s. Mostly it was, uh, uh, in the 50s is when it started, it started going away. So we're on to brick veneer. Now, if you think about it, siding, um, as, we, as we have, as I have here, is uh, 1.5 to 2.5 pounds per square foot. Average home would have about 5,100 to uh, pounds or two and a half tons that's hanging on the framing. Same with uh, your adhered stone, eight to 12 pounds per square foot. That's 20,500 or roughly 10 tons of stone, again, on the framing, hanging on the framing. So as, as you, he pointed out, I'm forgetting your name, I'm sorry. But uh, brick veneer is about 78,000 pounds on an average two-story house, 38 tons. What's supporting it? The, the wall has nothing to do with it. It's a freestanding system. Yep, totally freestanding. In fact, the only thing holding it in place really is gravity. 
if you think about it, the wall ties aren't even really doing anything. They were nice to have there when I was laying up the brickwork to keep it from you know falling off when it was green, but really they're there for um, to avoid catastrophe, like in a uh, earthquake or a car hit, car, car hits the building. They're they're as the brickwork stands, their wall ties are not in an engineering term working. They're not doing anything. The, the brickwork is standing on its own, and in fact. In theory, you should be able to strip out all of the framing and roofing and the brickwork would still be standing. Now, would, you know, could a breeze make, make it blow over? Yeah, but, you know, and that's where the framing comes in handy. So it, it, just keep in mind, it's an independent system. It's, it's a, basically a surround, it's a siding, but it is totally freestanding. And just remember, it's not structural. And that, that's where, you, People start to freak out when they see big cracks in brick veneer. It, it's pretty inconsequential. <laughs> it's, a, it's a surround. Now, sometimes it goes all the way to the footing, like we talked about before. This, this is another house. There's a lot of these houses in Virginia Beach where the house is actually sitting on piers and the brickwork goes all the way down to the footing. It's an unusual type of construction for Richmond or up here in the north. So what's going on when the brick veneer is leaving the front of the house pushed out a little bit yeah well, i was talking about that earlier and i'm going to kind of walk through that scenario right now most of the time keep in mind number one wall ties they're they're nailed to the wall high so again they're not really doing anything the brickwork can move out quite a bit before it would actually uh, start to actually tug on the, the on the wall tie. So again, they're there mostly for catastrophe's sake. If the brickwork starts to actually fall out, then they come into play. But in, when you have settlement of the framing, and the framing is going downward, and the brickwork is either staying where it is or actually rising up because the brick is growing, especially these real uh, thick wall ties like we use later on in my, my career, they were really hard to bend. They're really, they're tough wall ties. But in a case where they're being pulled, pushed upward, as the framing is going down, the wall tie can't go anywhere but out. And so I think what happens is it actually nudges the brickwork out away from the framing a little bit. That's the only thing I can come up with as far as why it moves away and starts stretching the, the sealant. And I think that's why they came up with these new wall ties that, that don't do that anymore. They'll slide up and down. Um, as far as brickwork uh, supporting decks, of course, we all know that you're not supposed to do it, but I threw it on here just because, oh, they can definitely support the weight. Brick Brickwork, again, can carry 50 times more weight than a deck. It can't handle the lateral. It can hand the weight. It can handle the weight. Does moisture intrude? My answer is it does not. But uh, here's the caveat. The problem with moisture coming into brickwork is because it's been improperly installed or flashing is gone um, or wasn't properly installed. These, this is the backside of brick veneer. As you can see, that's daylight in that bottom center picture. If you don't have full head joints, in your brickwork, of course, water's gonna get through it. If you have four inches of brick and four inches of uh, solid uh, mortar beds and head joints, no, it will not get through. But the problem is that with brick veneer, most of the uh, care in laying brickwork went south. People don't care. They just, you know, it, because it's a siding and because you're trying to get it up as fast as possible, they're very careless. They don't care what they're doing. And that, that's why brickwork leaks. It's more negligence and uh, neglect. And of course, flat window sills, well, yeah, they'll leak. You know, you're supposed to have a really good uh, slope on a window sill. This is new construction, they're flat. Of course, that's brick, brick that doesn't even tuck under the window. Yeah, that, that's going to leak. So again, it's, it's carelessness. If masonry is installed properly, 
full head joints, full bed joints, proper flashing, it will not leak. This is uh, one of my, oh, by the way, statements, just saying that, look, if the, flat, the sills are flat, they're going to be a problem. High maintenance item, you're going to have to watch it. So this is uh, flashing, uh, and again, this is, has to do with moisture intrusion, but these, this is old school flashing. This flashing is laid right into the brickwork, and then it comes down over top of your, uh, your it's counter flashing and flashing, it comes over top of your flashing. This system, the way it is now, although this is a little unusual to have these nails uh, in the brickwork, this flashing will last 100 to 150 years with no maintenance. You don't need any sealant. Now builders today, they're just going ahead and putting in flashing like this where the counter flashing just is pasted against the wall. It's a real tragedy because they've gone from a system that would be good for 150 years without having to touch it to a system that'll last five years. And from there on, it's problematic. And it's, it's just one of those things that, uh, in my mind, new home builders, to find this is acceptable, they ought to be shot. You know, that, that's just one of those things that just, they, don't, they truly don't build them like they used to. And no matter how old the house is, and this is new construction, but if there isn't sealant around the windows where they meet brickwork, it's wrong. And, that, and you'll see that on houses that are 10 years old where it was never caulked. Well, it needs to be caulked right now. You know, because yeah, that, that, will, that will leak for sure. Parapets that are not uh, properly maintained, they'll leak. Flashing on parapets, that, that will leak. Um, you know, parapets, they have capstones and, uh, and, and row locks over top of them, but they still need flashing. And if they don't have flashing underneath the row lock or the capstone, they can leak. There's flashing that is just, this is just a proof of flashing underneath that capstone. It got a little bit out of alignment, but I, I just took the photograph because it confirmed that it's actually there. <clears throat> Same with these terracotta uh, capstones, you need to maintain them. It's, it's all maintenance that, that allows uh, brick veneer or any masonry to leak. It's usually uh, not the system, it's, it's neglect. This flashing on the right uh, needs sealant. It's, it's all broken apart. This really is, uh, I like this system. And if you're having problems with moisture that's getting into the, the parapet, I, I wholeheartedly agree that you ought to just go ahead and use the membrane roofing and go up and over the, the parapet because it solves the problem. How much time we got? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So this is crackology. Basically, I want to dispel this myth. Stair step cracks mean nothing. You'll hear people say all the time, there's something significant about stair step crack. Oh, if it's a stair crack, step, step crack, it's fine. It has, it has nothing to do with it being stair step. The only reason that it cracked there, well, I'll show you in a second, but you know, cracks always happen along the, it, when they're, they're the result of tension and, and the system's ability to not handle that handle that tension or pressure. Um, of course, they get bigger the farther you get away. So if you have three stories of brick veneer, a very small, unintimidating crack at the bottom can look very intimidating three stories up. But remember, it's brick veneer. It's a siding. It's not structural. You know, it's not as big a deal as you think. But in terms of a stair-step crack, it just means that the mortar didn't bond to the brickwork well. You know, if the if the bond to the brickwork is really good, then it, you know, who knows where it'll crack. Uh, but stair step cracks usually happen because the the bond to brickwork and mortar uh, was was really weak, and that was the path of least resistance. So you just one It's about all you can do with that. It's ugly, isn't it? Um, uh, but I don't really remember or know um, what the result of this was as far as what was going on. I just had this picture because it's a stair step crack. There might have been more going on here that, that was actually structural. So when you pull up on a building and you're in your descriptions, you know, don't just because you see masonry, don't assume 
that it's the masonry foundation. It may not be. In this case, this house is actually on piers. They filled in with brickwork between the piers. So the house is not supported by a masonry foundation. It's supported by piers. So in your descriptions, you just want to make sure that you uh, get that right. And actually, in this case, the mortar, uh, the masonry that fills in between the piers was in better shape than the pier. <laughs> that pier has no mortar left in it. So again, this is another one of the oh, by way, by the way, uh, statements that I would have in my report. Okay, out of time, I guess. You have two minutes. Two minutes. I'll blow through this one. This is fascinating. So this this is a house that I was asked to do up in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, by a banker. Her daughter had bought the house, and she uh, and it had been inspected. She'd had it for a year, but um, they they just felt like there was more going on here than he reported, and there most definitely was a lot going on here. So first of all, you have you know your flat grade up against the house. And so I have my standard thing that says, this isn't a good idea. You should always have some slope on your grade. But this is the front brickwork across the front of the house. The brickwork is pushed up um, about an inch and a half. And it's also pushed in a little less than an inch. The roof, the gutter is crowned, of course, on purpose, but this gutter and the, the fascia and everything was very crowned. Something more than just the crown of the gutter was going on here. The whole front wall was crowned. And actually, the, I show this picture because if you look across the uh, <clears throat> surface of the roof, you can see that the roof is actually dipped. So there was a lot of stress going on here in this house. The whole center of the roof even was crowned upward, and then you can see how it goes down as you get towards the edges of the roof. So tremendous pressure going on here. You go up in the attic. Yeah, that's a collar tie. That's, not, that's supposed to be under tension, not compression. So there was a ton going on here, and it all had to do with the foundation. I don't know if the uh, rafters did this sag prior to or after they put in those uh, diagonal braces. They had added these diagonal braces, and I don't know if they exacerbated the problem or not. But what was going on was the foundation wall was buckling in. And what people don't really think about is there's a lot going on when a wall buckles in. So the wall was buckled in a little over a, uh, an inch and a quarter, or right around an inch and a quarter. So obviously a foundation wall is in fact a retaining wall, but it has the added support of the floor framing over top of it. In this case, the floor framing is under serious compression as well because that whole wall is pushing inward. But as the wall buckles, every time it buckles in, something's got to give and so you have these fulcrum points so you have a fulcrum point at the bottom of the footing or at the bottom of the foundation wall where it hits the footing another one midpoint where it buckles up top it's it's uh, you have other four fulcrum points and each one of these fulcrum points is lifting the house up a little bit on top of that because the bricks pushed inward it's curving out to meet the the plane of the brickwork above and those are fulcrum points so the amount of areas where there's actually some lift um, there's just a lot of lift going on here, and that's what was slowly uh, pushing everything else uh, out of um, its normal position. In the end, that's the only answer uh, that would be to go ahead and use carbon fiber straps, which, which is what it needed. Uh, trees close to foundations, do they actually do harm to foundations? Most of the time, no. Uh, I do see it now and then. In this case, yes, it was pretty extreme, but there was a caveat here too. This is not a solid masonry foundation. In this case, it was brick on piers. Uh, and yep, when you got inside, the piers were being pushed in too. Most of the time, uh, trees will grow around the footing and foundation because it was here first <laughs> and it kind of resists or goes around it. Huh? Does it also depend on the type of tree, like the type of root 
cut through structures that go straight down or maybe like a maple that goes up. I don't know about you, but I've gone into crawl spaces that had uh, roots as big as my arm and nothing's happened to the foundation. Okay. You know, so I think usually in most cases, they grow around the house. They'll, they'll, you know, the house wins. Now, if there's a big wind or if it blows over, all bets are off now. If something bad could happen. Yeah, if it's all underneath the house, the house like that. Yeah, if it blows over or I guess, in, you know, it could, in rocking, it could also do some damage. But, you know, in my career, I haven't seen it uh, very often. That was really one of the only times I really saw tree roots do significant damage. Thanks a lot, Mike. Okay.